<laughs> hey everybody! <laughs> it's time! It is not Tipsy Tuesday, so I'm not pulling wine out of this fridge right now. Uh, it is a Monday night, which means once a month it is time for Sip, Share, Advocate. And that's a, a show where we talk all about uh, special needs, learning disabilities, autism, and uh, we bring in experts and chat about these topics um, so that we can bring these experts to your living room um, to talk about things that maybe you're thinking, hey, maybe something's going on, maybe I should be uh, on the lookout for things. Um, so last week we had a great guest, uh, it was last month, we had uh, Riza Miro Lemonas Lemonakis. Um, talking all about uh, reading issues and speech and language issues. Um, tonight we're excited because we have a fan favorite, is what I'm going to call him. Um, he uh, was a great part of our process, as was Riza, uh, in doing everything with our daughter. Um, and so uh, he's a great resource. Um, so tonight I want to introduce, reintroduce to you, fan favorite, Dr. Richard Selznick is with us. So clappy, clap, clap. <laughs> I am so thank sober. You, thank, thank you for asking. Yeah, well, we're, we're sipping water and so seltzer, this so, God, you know, that's, that's awful. I gave up sugar, which was an awful idea, just so you know. Yeah. And um, so that includes wine as well. No, <laughs> on, no, on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, Tuesdays is my have... cheat day. So I gotta come on Tuesdays. So I, I save it for Tipsy Tuesday. Yeah, I mean I'm not crazy. So, um, so a show a little different than Tipsy. You go, yeah. See, we're backwards in order for them to be forwards. Um, so anyway, so tonight, um, it's a little different, like I said, from Tipsy Tuesday. Uh, Sip, Share, Advocate is all about bringing experts in and uh, talking about a topic. So um, if you read our, our title, uh, tonight's topics um, is Essentials for Learning Disabilities and Dyslexia. And uh, I'm going to have Dr. Selznick tell everybody a little bit about yourself so they know where you're coming from and, and, and why you're here tonight. Why is tonight so special? <laughs> Go ahead. Why is um well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate having me on the show. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I have spent, you know, basically my entire career working with kids who have struggled in school. Uh, they don't all have dyslexia. Some some of them are struggling with uh, other issues. Uh, could be some anxiety about school-related topics. It could, but most of the kids are coming in that I evaluate. Um, have some kind of a learning problem of some kind that is then resulting in, you know, them feeling insecure and uptight about it. So, um, as I said, you were part of our, our process. Mm -hmm. How many, just out of curiosity, it's, it's not what we're talking about tonight, yeah. but out of curiosity, how many parents are you getting that are saying, I think that there's something going on, and, and then you find nothing? Like, for the most part, are you finding that mom gut is pretty reliable? in terms of like him like coming to you i think there's something wrong nobody believes me like what are the percentages is it like 10 percent? there's nothing wrong or well with, with the exception of you exception no. of me because <laughs> i knew i was right with coming in i was just waiting for you to you. confirm my results um, um I, look i as one of the essentials in my book i i have emphasized to the moms trusting your mom gut, mm -hmm. you know, that I have learned over the years that when moms think there's something going on, almost always there is. Now, whether it's mom. legitimately dyslexia or, you know, ADHD, you know, yeah, there's something that going the on. The gut isn't very specific. Right, right. The gut's like something's up. Almost always. I would say, you know, I use a lot of phrasing, let's say something like, you know, it might sound cliche-ish, where there's smoke, there's fire. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that way. So almost always when a mom says there's something going on, there is. Now, what happens in that process, though, that doesn't necessarily, this is really, really important for you moms out there, that doesn't necessarily mean that the school is going to go, <laughs> They're not gonna ah, <laughs> we agree with you. Or and that that's the hard or, part. Or that the child is effectively bad enough to be to get help to get well to get classified to get testing, 
it, to, to get classified in special education, which is a, it's That's a very complicated, very confusing. it's very and, confusing. And just to and, let you know, we, uh, we have vision therapy coming up next week, uh, the correlation between vision and educational learning issues. That's next month. Um, but we also have some lawyers lined up to come in and talk about those issues that, you know, when you think there is a problem and what, whether it's confirmed, you're not a lawyer. You can't you have be other on people? every show. Come on. I, all right, first of all, I want to say something. On, first of on. all, your scarf is very snazzy. Oh, was that a choice? Were you like, let me? Well, you know, I checked it out with the, with the missus before. It's nice. Time, you know? I like it. You, you know stepped you it up. Yeah. You had, your sweater was not my favorite <laughs> over there, but you took yeah, it off, yeah, and yeah. now you look good. So thank I just want to say thank you. But I, I'm All right, and also, of I'm going to just say it because he likes to talk about his books. But today is a big day because this is a new book. <gasps> Tell everybody about it. It comes out today. Today, today, today literally today. I had uh, the, I got a pre-delivery last week, but you know, yes. It's exciting. So what it's what book exciting. number is this? Because I know you like four. to brag. Look at it. I have one. Yeah, there's much to brag it's about. So I got to brag about long. the books. Yeah, yeah. So, no. you know. Yeah, my my book is only ten pages long, and it's dirty, oh. and it's for moms. <laughs> Mine is not dirty. Mine is dirty. Yeah, you God. should get both of our oh, books. Oh boy. All, All right. right. So uh, so let's get to it. So tonight we're talking about essentials for learning disabilities and dyslexia. What I think is very helpful, uh, I'm a dyslexia therapist struggling to educate co-workers. Keep it up, mama, let's get aware. It's true, it's true. So tonight's about dyslexia, um, but certain, we're gonna talk specifically about some of these stages. What I think right. is helpful is that, you know, I think it's interesting that, you know, for the most part, hopefully we'll, we're catching dyslexia early, right? But I'm right. sure that there are kids that are in high school who are Absolutely. finding it out, yeah. or maybe even people older. So, can you talk a little bit about these stages um, or these, uh, you know, these markers that, you know, if you're in elementary school, you know, what are some of these mm -hmm. um, kind of marks that you should be hitting, or what are signs that there might be a problem? A model that I I really like to follow, and that what I and I didn't create this one. It's from Dr. Jean Charles. She's deceased, but she wrote. Uh, the stages of, of reading development and it's it's helpful to think about these stages so that you know it's, it's she actually created one stage zero so stage zero sounds like well you know she, but stage zero is effectively preschool you know like you know so you're learning your letters and all children not just dyslexic children but all children pass through these stages mm -hmm. when you have learning problems you get stuck more so in a stage so, you get, so and you, then can you not continue through this well, continuum? it's harder it's much harder to continue through so let's just say you're in stage zero normally leaving kindergarten going into first grade becomes the big the next big stage where mm -hmm. stage one is effectively uh, first grade, mm -hmm. where you're learning your basic sight words, your letters, all that kind of stuff. And when you have a learning problem, you are, are getting stuck at a stage of development. So like like stage one, you know, so, so if I evaluate a young child, who, let's, let's say a child who's eight years old, mm -hmm. who's getting, having difficulty. So in, that's like first, second grade-ish, right? Yeah, second, third grade, okay. and they're struggling within a first grade level with reading fluently, with decoding, with phonics, all that kind of stuff, they're, they're effectively getting stuck in, that, in stage. that stage of development. So, and, and then, you know, so whereas, you know, stage two, you're a little bit more fluent, typically occurs around middle first grade, I mean, middle, uh, end of first grade going to second grade. It's a longer stage. It goes from second grade through about the middle of third grade. When you get out of stage two, you're, you're usually well on the road to reading. That, so it's really that one to two that, that, is the, that right, we exactly. start to identify. All right, so here's my question. I don't know if this, you can answer this question, but is there something that is so unique? Is there some symptom or something that's so unique to dyslexia that if somebody is uh, showing this particular either language or or reading issue that you're like this starting to really feel like dyslexia like as a normal person right like I I, just, I would just know something's wrong but like uh, are you able to are you able to say there are certain things that are in common with people that all have this dyslexia the, the most common feature is is this kind of you know inability to smoothly read when you're listening to a child read middle first grade going to, you know they're 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 
getting it. Is it, like a, is it like a hesitation? It, it could be a hesitation. God it could you. be uh, miscuing in a sense. You're, you're What's that? Miscuing. Mis you know, you're reading uh, the word. When you come upon a word like porcupine, you might go, uh, the prickaprines are, you know, you're substituting words that, you know, aren't there. You know, they're, mm -hmm. you're miscuing mm -hmm. for the word that's in the text, if that makes sense, okay. you know. Um, that's, and then there, always it's a spelling and writing problem that goes with. So, so how is it then, I mean, that seems pretty easy, right, to identify. So mm -hmm. how is it that there are so many kids in high school that are seemingly not being diagnosed in high school or even adults that aren't aren't diagnosed? Is it, is it that just for years we don't... We don't put enough emphasis on the smooth ability to read? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are a lot of kids who kind of get by with, they're not, in effect, bad enough. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, they've memorized words, yeah. their reading is okay. Um, but this, I, t I sometimes explain it to parents as, imagine you're running a race and you, you know that there's a little bit of a heel spur. There's something bothering you. Mm -hmm. But now people aren't really picking, it's not a full-blown injury, mm -hmm. but it's something that's, Causes you to kind of okay. I don't feel like running this race. So they're, they're able to is, compensate. They're compensating. They're smarter. You know, frankly, a lot of girls. A lot of the girls because and I know it shouldn't be generalizing. Mm -hmm. You know, in this day and age. But you know, because you you have people who who are compensating by not, you know, they can get along well in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're they're teacher pleasing behaviors that no one's noticing the fact that they don't really read, spell, or write all that. Way. And, uh, you know, it was interesting, but uh, before we started talking, um, you had described dyslexia as a spectrum, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting because I never really hear that word described unless we're talking about autism. Right. You know, and what you're saying now, like, uh, I, can you have a little bit of dyslexia? Well, one of, one of the hardest to, parts to, for is me. Is it like a side dish sometimes yeah. to other things? No, that's a great question. One of the hardest parts for me, you know, because I'll go through this battery of tests, and the mom will say, so, does he have it or, or does she have yeah. it? I'm like, uh-huh, I'm still not sure. You know, there, there are so many kids who are in the zone of, I'm putting in quotes, average, where they're a little bit behind. They, you know, when you listen to them reading or you watch them writing, you can see that it's labored. You can see that it's difficult for them to do it. But they may not have, you know, do they really have a full-blown dyslexia? That's mm -hmm. what you have to weigh other variables, such as, you know, did one of the other parents have it? You know, is usually almost always it's based somewhere that you, and not that, not that I always blame the male one. Well, it doesn't matter. Just all blame, do. you know, yes, blame the male one. Yeah, you blame the joining the party. Actually, and, and even I, <laughs> I joke about it. It's, but is it normally but it's more so women? into the male line. Is I, it? You know, I do find that almost always the guy, I know again, I'm going to get myself into trouble here, but I find myself not more sure. so that the guy has these characteristics. He may not have been identified when well, he was Well, that's my younger. next question. Are you finding, like, if children that are being identified, do you have, have you heard that a lot of parents are then going and getting tested? And yeah, Not necessarily, but I think you, a typical, and this is what I wrote about in Shutdown Learner, a typical profile are, are, men or people who are very good with hands-on tasks. Mm -hmm. they're, they're builders, they're architects, they, they know how to put things together. They're very, what are visual, they're strong in a spatial area. Mm -hmm. But they didn't like to read, spell, or write. So when you ask them, how is school for you? Oh, I hated school. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Now, were you tested? No, I wasn't. Do you want to get tested? No, I'm fine. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm I, go I, that's a, it's really okay. But yeah. you see the early threads in the family, you see it a, a kind of pass down, mm -hmm. and that helps me with the diagnosis. Right. If you know, if neither parent had it, it's less likely to be dyslexic. I did not realize that it was so genetically linked. But it's also, yeah, and it's also it's a spectrum in the sense that you can have mild reading issues, yeah, you can so have yeah. more moderate issues. You and mean I, I have, mild I have to moderate kids. dyslexia or mild to moderate? Because we don't, you said this before the show as well. You said most people don't realize that dyslexia, even though we have a special name for it, is yeah. still a, a reading disorder. It's, 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 func it's functionally a reading, it's a reading disorder. And even that gets me stuck because it's a reading, spelling, writing disorder. Always, it's a package deal, gang. Always. It's almost never 
I, I, I could almost go to never, that if when a person, excuse me, has what I think is this reading disability, this, this uh, dyslexia, 99.9% mm. .9 of the time they have a spelling disorder or spelling problem and a writing problem that's worse than the reading problem. So it's always a package deal. It's not just so the reading problem. So isn't dyslexia the spelling problem? Or you're saying the spelling problem is something separate? It goes, uh, t t the way I see it is it's a package deal. It's a package deal of reading, spelling, and writing that I'm struggling with as this dyslexic person. It's really, really rare to have a person who has dyslexia who is writing fluently or spelling fluently. So Very Louise rare. is asking you, can you talk about math dyslexia? Math dyslexia. Is that a thing? Uh, is it like just flipping numbers? Is it? The I same? guess we might be talking about flipping numbers and spatial and visual perceptual kinds of things. I don't tend to see that as much. I think that sometimes the math, what I think of as math dyslexia, may be linked to word problem issues. That, that a lot of times the dyslexics are having trouble with word problems. Isn't and, there? You know, is the what's dysgraphia? Isn't dysgraphia that? is a writing disorder. You know, the, uh, disorder of, of the written expression. You know, with dysgraphia is. I tend to see dysgraphia more as the motor aspects of writing, um, you know, where, where they're having difficulty forming their letters, forming the words, that mm. kind of thing. But dyslexics have trouble with that too. Yeah, now, you see, why why I see dyslexia as, as a bit of a spectrum, I have people who have, I've contacted once this book came out mm -hmm. who I think of as in my hall of fame of dyslexics, mm. meaning these Hall are people, well, meaning they were so severe, you know, they, it, it, still to this day, even though I've tested thousands of people over in my career, I'm, my mind is boggled when I'm, when I'll meet a, a young person, doesn't, whatever age, you know, and things that we take for granted that a seven year old can do, right. a seven or eight year old can do, or ten, and you see how severely disabled they are in their challenges with, printed word, you know, they just, they can't read spell, in, in spite of the fact that they're above average intelligence. So there are people, the Hall of Fame meaning they're so severe, they're so struggling that it's, you know, wow. quite severe, quite profound. So if you are just joining us, we are here tonight with Dr. Richard Selznick and his fancy scarf, and we are talking about the essentials of dyslexia and uh, just, uh, you know, learning disabilities in general, uh, but his new book just came out today, make sure you check it out. Um, the 25 Essentials. And uh, if you know of anybody, do us a favor. Uh, this is a new show. This is only our third episode of Sip, Share, Advocate. Uh, do me a favor, share this episode uh, now. Uh, let people know what the show is about. Um, like I said, every week we'll be talking about something different. Next month we're going to be talking about visual issues and education, how it affects learning, uh, as well as legal issues coming up. We have a great month about autism coming up. Um, so do us a favor and share it if you can. Tag people uh, that you may know that may want to to get on in the conversation. Uh, we're also taking questions as well if you'd like to. We're going to try to add someone to the conversation. So Dr. Selznick hasn't done that yet, so it'll be very exciting. So let's go to our next point because you talk a lot about the difference between type 1 and type 2 readers. So tell me what does that it's, mean. It's and you made that up, right? I it's did your make thing. It, I did make it up. All right, tell everybody. I make up a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, Again, it's a shorthand for me to understand what type of you know, you're coming in as a mom and you want to know what's going on with my kid. The vast majority of kids that I evaluate are what I call type one, Roman numeral one readers. Those are the ones that fit the definition or the characteristics of reading disorder, dyslexia. Okay. These are kids, the type one readers are, are the, the, the vast majority of people who are referred for special ed evaluations are type 1 readers. Okay, so who's left? Well, so what, what they show, these are the kids that are just fluent with reading, they, they stumble, they struggle. The type 2 are really interesting. They're not dyslexic. They re, when you listen to them read out loud, they, you know, testing for dyslexia is a process. They're, they're reading smoothly and fluently, but when you ask them questions about the text like that they've read, the these are purely people who are struggling with comprehension as a, as a reading problem, mm -hmm. as a learning problem, mm -hmm. but it's not grounded in the fact that they misread the words, which is what the type 1 readers do. With the type 1 readers, you know, the, the interference in the text is so significant that 
you know, you can't understand what you're reading, whereas a type two are a totally different. Type they're of reading, reading it, but they're, they're not re- getting any exactly. of that. Exactly. And do you find that it uh, it's harder to diagnose a type two because type one would yeah, be Yeah, I think obvious, they're often right? overlooked. I think the type two readers are often overlooked. I think that that you know the the people will assume that they don't have learning problems when I think that they, they do. And they often have difficulty with inferential thinking, they reading between the lines, you know, uh, summarizing text, drawing mm-hmm. conclusions, things mm-hmm. like that. And I would say that that's kind of where our story is more. It was very difficult. Like, um, you know, I, I think that by the time I got to you, mm-hmm. I, I was pretty straightforward by the time right. I got to, I'm going to call him Seltzy. And I was like, listen, I know there's a problem. This is what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and it was a fight. It was a fight to get anybody to listen because right. on paper, it looked fine. Um, but if you sit down and you listen to her read, it was very fluent. Um, but the comprehension yeah. was yeah. Uh, was a problem. Can you just give them words like no? Oh, hold on, what did she say? Give them words like and see if they can read on. Saw and was, etc. Oh, so Vicky's trying to say, can you give them words and and you say saw and was? Are they able to tell the difference then as like a screening? I guess she's yeah. Saying. I mean. I- the was saw stuff is is commonly used as one of those type of screener. I would, uh, what if I were a mom or a parent? Usually it's a mom's mm-hmm. dad's don't do this stuff. If I were a mom, I would, let's say I had a seven year old, I would open up a representative book. You know, you try the typical second grade reading book and listen to how they read. You know, does it sound relatively smooth? Are they making a lot of errors in the text? Are they putting substituting words that are nonsensical? That kind of thing. If they are, then that could be a problem. That doesn't mean automatically, gang, that they're dyslexic, but it's a way of saying to yourself, hmm, I think there's something going on. I don't like the way this sounds. Certainly, as you move into the third, fourth, fifth grade, they should absolutely be able to read smoothly. Uh, by that point. So by the time you're in the upper elementary school, your child is stumbling along and I call it hacking through the jungle. You know, you're like trying to get through the weeds when it should be, a, again, a, a smooth... Mm-hmm. The reading text should be like simple math problems. You know, if I say to you, what's three plus two? You don't go, well, wait a minute, let me think about that. Depends get back on how to much you. wine I've had. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I get what you you're know, saying. It's, the, it should be an easy kind of process for, for, for the basics of reading, you know what I mean? Um, this is not my dad. I hope I answered that question. Look, somebody said, is that your dad? No, my dad does not wear scarves this nice, just so you know. No. Um, but now I'm going to have to get him one. <laughs> this is Dr. Richard Selznick, and he is a fan favorite here at Sip Share Advocate. Uh, we're talking tonight about the essentials of learning disabilities and dyslexia. Uh, do me a favor. I think we can take a question. So if you have a question, just comment and say I have a question, and we'll pick one of you randomly, and we'll add you to the call, and you can talk to Dr. Selznick about whatever you, question you have. Remember, he loves loves writing books about dyslexia, but you can ask him about any learning disabilities. Um, he has a great practice uh, and it really helped us. Can you tell the difference between types, uh, types, types of dyslexia? dyslexia? My daughter has dysphonic dyslexia and dys... De- what does that say? Dys... dys... dyslexia? Are these words? Oh boy, I'm not sure that dys I know that there's, there's some people who really split split hairs on this kind of dyslexia. I don't tend to go there, I apologize. Uh, the dysphonic is more so what I understand dyslexia to be. You know, these are people who have trouble with the phonetic aspects, phonological processing, meaning they have difficulty with the underlying component sounds of words, you know? So if you say, say the word flat, say flat. Flat. Now say flat, but don't say f. Flat. Right, so that's, an awareness of sound within. So what so, is the difference between phonological impairment and dyslexia? Isn't phon- that hearing? Phonological impairment, my understanding, at least I'm not a speech and language specialist, but phonological impairment is a, contr- is a major contributing variable to what leads, it correlates, it goes together. So if a person has a phonological, you know, you give a test like what, what we give, um, the comprehensive test of phonological processing, the CTOP. So when the person has difficulty with these phonological tasks, you can make very good predictions that they're going to be, strug- going to be struggling with reading, spelling, and writing. They go together. 
So, but not, not always. You could have phonological impairment and be an adequate reader. It's possible, but rare, if that makes sense. They correlate, they go together. Yeah. Is there, uh, yeah, no, you're using a lot of big words. So, is there something that if you have dyslexia, there is a high, there's a high occurrence of also having this? Oh, wait, Rosie said, oh, she, she said her mom couldn't say words like tiger and California. Was that the phonological? That could be. You know, you'd have to test your mom. I mean, you'd have to find out. That doesn't automatically mean she's going to be struggling with reading, spelling, and writing. You know, she could have had articulation issues. She could have had other kinds of speech and language problems. What they're... skills do you suggest our kiddos use to cope with their reading disabilities? Are there certain skill sets that you recommend? Do you like? Do you push a kid with dyslexia to like do a lot of reading, or is it um... so? So much of it, I believe, depends on age and stage of the child. You know, if I'm an angry, shut down learner style kid who is says, F it, I don't want to be doing school anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, what do I, how do I help that kiddo along? I mean, I've got to kind of work with them to, to help them not shut down, you know? If it's a much younger child, um, I'm going to be hopefully working on linking them with a good tutor who does, you know, what the, 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 the right methods, like Orton Gillingham style methodologies. Yeah. So, um, someone... Uh, Tori just wrote, I have a special needs daughter and she is at a third grade reading level but in the 10th grade. How, how does that... Yeah, that's an issue. I mean, I, I would have to, I would obviously, you know, I would need more data. Yeah, like, I would I need mean, more information but, you know, I, you know, that could be one of those types where I call them in my hall of fame. I mean, that's a, you know, I don't know other things. I don't want to get, mm -hmm. you know, go too far into a, you know, making judgments about that, but that, yeah, it, it, that could be quite significant. With that person, I might want to get them on Learning Ally, which is, uh, which What's allows, that? Learning Ally is a resource for people, once you qualify as having a learning disability, uh, reading, dyslexia, you can download all, you know, a, a wide range of books in an audio format that you well, can listen to. Well, that's what, so my cousin Andrea is watching and she just said audio books help. Speechify yeah. is a great app to help kids with text that has no audio. Um, What's that? Speechify is a great app to help kids with text. That have no audio. I'm not sure what that I don't, exactly yeah. is. I have a it says, I have a student who is in 11th grade who didn't know that hat and bat was just changing one letter. Right. That's a, that's an example of that kind of phonological deficit that, that we're talking about. Is it better to go with a private diagnosis or via the school district? I could answer this one. Well, go ahead. If you... <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you from the mom perspective. I tried to go the school uh, route, and we did for many years. Um, and I was being told in my meetings that we were doing this testing. Um, in this last round of testing, which led me to Seltzy um, and to Riza, um, Riza had found some things in her testing that were su very surprising, which was speech and language. And I remember in fifth grade, she had the same testing done. And I said, well, how does it compare to the fifth grade testing? And she looked in, she was like, well, they didn't do that. They didn't test for this. And I go, no, they did because there was a problem in fifth grade and they told me that they tested for it. And she goes, they probably just, there's three tests and they ordered two of them. They didn't order the third test. And had they ordered the third test, I would have known three years prior that there was a problem. See, look, he's all, he's all uncomfortable because I'm saying it. I'm just telling you my experience, which is why we do this show, because had I met a mom who had similar issues that was able to say, hey, maybe try this test, maybe ask for this test. You know, I think that this show is all about advocating for your children, knowing what questions to ask, getting access to people like him, getting access to other moms, because when I do have breakdowns on the internet and I talk about this, um, I get letters uh, and emails from moms and dads and, and kids who grew up with issues like this all saying this is exactly, you have no idea how many emails I've gotten that have said, your, your story of what's going on with your family is the exact same issue that I had. We've got, to tell people, so, we've got to tell people they so I I evaluated your child at the Cooper Learning so, Center. I forgot to Cooper, Cooper Learning Center. Cooper Learning Center. So we did it through was... the school, but the school said we'll give you the option if you want us to do it in-house or outside. I was like, outside. 
one of, look, I'm not in a position it's where I want, I don't, I, I'm not here as a school apologist, I'm a defender of school. However, However, what's important, I think, to keep in mind is that the school is evaluating not to test for dyslexia or they're not even necessarily diagnosing. School evaluations are designed to determine eligibility of service. And that's a different, at least that's my understanding. And I think a that's a great question. way to say it. That's a different question. And I did not know so, that. So if you come into my office and you say to me, Richard, do you think my child has a learning problem you mean or not? Celsi. 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 If you come into my office and say, Richard or Celsi, do you think my kid has a learning problem? I can evaluate that, okay? Or some kind of issue. And I could say to you, yeah, he's got a mild issue or moderate severe. That's different than is my child eligible for services or classifiable, which is where I think you got. Yeah, kind of see, I didn't like that up. when he said it. And I was. I was hung up. Um, and I said, I don't understand what you're saying. Right. You're supposed to just tell me if there's a problem. And then I take these papers back to the school. And then they say, no, yes, it doesn't work this is what way. you're going to get. That's your fantasy. I it did not know that. that yeah, but how many people don't know that? And how many people are sitting in the room? Listen, here's what's happening. I'm the just telling you, table. I'm telling you from a mom perspective. If I'm coming to the table, because this is my first kid, I don't know anything about an IEP meeting. We sit in the room, all the teachers are on that side, I'm by myself on this side, right? And then they say, you, they're not eligible for, for help. In your mind, you think, okay, so then nothing's wrong because it feels like something's that's wrong. That's also not true. What? That doesn't mean that there's nothing well, wrong. Well, that's what I'm trying to say to you is that most parents don't know that. I think that most parents, are, you know, the first, the first signal that something's wrong is either going to happen at your kitchen table or it's going to happen at school. And if it's... If it's, if it's seemingly only happening at the kitchen table or a little bit at school and the teacher says, well, there's, you know, the school is saying there's nothing wrong. I think that that point that you just said is a very important point for, for parents to understand that just because they're not eligible doesn't mean that there's not Correct. a spectrum so, perhaps right. so of things happening. I, look, I think a private evaluation like would be done whether it's, you know, through me or some other person in your area, wherever you are. You need to go to somebody that you can trust, that you can feel has experience evaluating children, can size up kids, can cover the, in effect, the territory. It doesn't have to be the most extensive evaluation. It could be a reasonably uh, extensive type of assessment. But you need to be able to talk to somebody who you can say, number one, I think, does my child have a problem are you anything. confirming yes anything Any problem. are you con yes are you confirming for me that he or she does or does not have an issue something going and on. and then from there i talk about what i call the pie chart of variables meaning all right it's not you know so what i get my backup about outside professionals is when they say well it's add i'm like what does that mean is that the effectively the whole pie chart is explained by add frank can i curse a little or no i shouldn't no, not... it's bs it's not that's a tipsy you know, tuesday yeah tipsy tuesday it's not it's it's not you know more 95 to 99 percent of the time there are other variables that are contributing to the child being off task they might have some ADD, but they also might have some dyslexia. They might have some reading issues and spelling issues. And that might, or they might have something, I tested a girl's point, had significant anxiety. Well, we didn't know if it came first. Right, and, cart, and, horse. Yeah, we didn't know if the anxiety was primarily contributing to her reading mm -hmm. problems or the reading problems that were undiagnosed. For, she was, this girl was 20 years old. And I evaluate her at 20, you know, so it's not like it has to be at six, seven, eight years, 20 years old. And, you know, which comes first. Mm -hmm. and so my point is that an outside person is more apt to be able to say to you, yes, there's an issue. And here are the issues that I believe are there that I'm identifying. But please be careful with assuming that goes back to the limits of school, where the school may not feel that that child is classifiable in special education terms. Yeah. I think that that is the most important thing because uh, going into it, knowing nothing, um, I kept going to that table um, thinking that, you know, right. I knew something was wrong and that we were going to do something, right. but maybe it didn't reach their levels of it. And that's what they said. They were like, she needs to fail more in order for us to 
you know, and, and honestly, and I shouldn't say it, but there were times where, you know, she'd be getting ready for a test. And I, I was like, do your best. Like at this yeah. point when we were spending five hours a day studying and I'm like, this is not normal. Like this is, so at some point I was like, I kind of hope you fail. Cause if you fail just right, a right. little bit more, yeah. then people are going to see that there is an actual issue. But if your kid lives in that space where they're struggling so much, but they're not failing enough, it just becomes, uh, it's, it's very difficult to know yeah, how to console your child. It's, it's, You're like, it's overwhelming. Oh, it's frustrating. And, 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 and then also like you described, you know, typically a mom again, you're sitting around a table with professionals passing, effectively passing judgment. Yeah, I'm a comedian. Child. I don't know anything. Yeah, so it's it's a, it's a very intimidating. I know process. nothing. Even when you do know something about really this stuff, know. it's it's it could be quite challenging. Is there a correlation with OT and dyslexia? Are there characteristics that could be indicators? I know OT is occupational therapy. Yeah. Is that it? Is yeah, that what that's that means? I, that's what I would understand OT yeah. to be occupational. Look, a lot, again... I, oh, like, I, is it helpful for dyslexia? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I that's what... You know, I think that it's often, with especially young kids, they're given OT and speech and language early on. That seems to be a go-to thing that schools do to give the kid OT, OT for well, writing problems. That, oh, because they're, they're working on... But really, the writing is much deeper than just the motor issue of writing. Mm -hmm. They don't understand sentence structure. They don't understand, mm -hmm. you know, what sentence, what a sent the concept of a sentence. Mm -hmm. They don't know where to, you know, they, they have no feel for for run-ons and fragments and things like that, that OT is not going to cover. So I, where I get, where I push back on the OT, I think OT can be very, you know, it's an excellent therapeutic service, mm -hmm. but for deeper writing issues of which the kids of concern have, they, you know, the writing problems are quite significant. They need much more than OT. Well, do you think, because I mean, I've been this person, do you think that if you have a child with dyslexia or any of learning disabilities that if some, like there were points where if somebody was like, listen, you need to get a cow, you need to walk the cow three times a day, and you need to eat a lot of chocolate. I'd be like, done, we're going to do it. Like, don't you think that at some point that people are so desperate yeah. that if they're like, yeah, OT, that's the way to go. Sure, like, Sure, but it's, but it's throwing you a bone. I mean, look, again, is. I think that you, we'll it feels good that, oh, we're getting OT. Well, that's mm -hmm. great, but that's only the first level of of you know in effect taking care of you know or trying to address writing problems are brutal yeah. writing problems are flat out difficult more so than reading and but again keep in mind I keep saying it's they a package it. deal yeah and the writing is much harder than the reading all right so before we go um your Still third ready. point tonight i know it went very quickly because i get real angry um <laughs> the third point tonight was something that you talked about the importance of listening to moms and the matthew effect what is that the matthew effects are you know are have to do with the rich get richer effect. It came, comes out of the book of Matthew, for those of you who are oriented toward religious terminology. Uh, you know, that the rich get richer to, uh, you know, unto the wealthy get more. So the kids that like to read at six years old, they, they read more and they get better at it. Well, if I'm not very good at six, seven, eight years old, I'm going to say, oh, I don't want to read. I hate reading. Uh, so I don't get better at it because I'm not practicing the skill. Yeah. I hate it. I avoid it. So the ma that's why listening to the moms. By the big message of you know, the, you could you could Google Matthew effects and you'll see some great articles on it. I didn't make this one up. Okay. Um, you know, but you could. You know, it, that's where the the idea of listening to the moms comes into play because if you think at six years old seven years old your child is having difficulty if you can if you can afford to often it's out of pocket no. that's one of the issues yeah but if you can afford to have your child evaluated early to identify whether they do have a an issue a problem that cuts into the matthew effects then you're able to go for tutoring you're able to get the the you know like at our center but tutoring you hit the nail on the on the head it's it was so expensive at every turn to because I'm I am pretty moderate. That's you're funny. moderate. Um, but you know, if the schools at you know very early on we, we weren't sure what it was. Yeah. We wanted to have a hearing test, but she was in second or third grade right. and they said these hearing tests 
are not reliable until fourth grade. And I was like, okay, but we should do something, right? This, uh, give me the cow and I'll walk it, right? Like, I don't care. Right. And uh, they said, well, we won't pay for it because it's not reliable until she's nine and she's only seven. I was like, so you want to wait two more years? So I was like, we're yeah. just going to pay for it. Yeah. So yeah. we paid for it to get right. done, which was astronomical. And when it was all said and done, we found out there were no actual impairments, right? But... Um, but she had problems with figure grounds, like yeah. this ability to not hear the, the hum of the refrigerator or the kids playing outside, um, and that she was switching words. Right. So the most interesting, so we had that test done and she had to remember two words, ice cream and football. And she said, just remember those words. I'm gonna ask you those words again at the end. And we were like, great. And so she got to the end and she goes, tell me the two words that I told you. And she said, um, ice ball and foot cream. And both words, right. which could be words, like pick right. other words that could not be really other words. Right. Um, and she said, you know, no one's ever done that before. Um, I don't know what that's called, but yeah. there's something about this switch. Um, and so even though I did not get a definitive, um, the red you know, there red was, the red she doesn't have a hearing disability, right. you know, I didn't get that. And I didn't really get anything other than ice ball and foot cream, but I told that story to every practitioner, including Selzy. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but that's not normal. Well, you know, the way to think about it, and this is how I'd be thinking about it if you came to my center or if you came to see me, would be I'd be saying to myself, hmm, you know, ice ball, whatever, ice, ice ball, ball, foot, foot cream. cream. Mm -hmm. hmm, that's an interesting error there. That could be what I would see as a red flag. I tend to think of red flags. That I, That's why I do a history taking. Part of the reason this stuff is expensive, I really, all kidding aside, have, have had a mission to try to keep these things moderate from what the services, both at Cooper Learning Center and whenever I've done testing on the side, you know, I, I, I recognize it could be prohibitively expensive, but part, but, but we've tried to keep the cost down. Part of it is it takes a long time, you know, to do a decent enough evaluation, yeah. you know, be, be, I'm doing a, a minimum of an hour history with mm -hmm. you then minimum of three or four hours with the child. It's not just like 15 minutes yeah. in and out, you know? Yeah. So it's a lot of time. And then you have to analyze the test and score them and write up the report, that kind of thing. So, But those are red flags of concern. Right. At so, least for me, it was something to walk out with and say, I'm yeah. not crazy. There's something here. I don't know what it is. The, the takeaway for the moms is to find... I, I'm biased towards psychologists who are grounded in this kind of work who can evaluate a child and talk to you plainly. That's what I would encourage you to try so to do. So we were talking about this before the show. Like if, uh, so if you would like more information, you can read the 25 Essentials of Dyslexia, for 25 Essential Points for Parents. Um, you can also contact Dr. Selsey at where? Shutdownlearner.com. See, I remember. Wait, and he has a weekly blog. Correct. I have on my website, I have over moms, I, I say moms oh, wow. because again, the dads don't read this stuff. You know, uh, over 350 blog posts there. There are videos, all, all, all for the plucking. It's there free, you know. But sign up on the website for the blog. But I'm, for those of you in the South Jersey area, I'm at the Cooper Learning Center, which is part of Cooper University Health System. And it's great. Um, and if you're outside the area, you contact me through my website. And I also do distance consultations with you guys. You know, you could send me your stuff and I'll review it. If you've had, a, you know, you're, I had a person contacting me from Minnesota recently and she wants to send me her, her testing material to go over it with her. Mm -hmm. And I'm, that's a service I provide, you know, on the side. So I want to ask you a question real quick. But so Jill is watching. I've been watching your. Well, um, you yes, yeah, pulled that back up. Um, Jill had just posted. It's, it's called "What to Do About Dyslexia." How do we Twenty-five essential. Twenty-five points for essential parents. points for parents. It literally came out today. Came out today. Yeah. We're like yeah. Oprah right now, book club. <laughs> so you can get it at shutdownlearn.com. You can also get it at Amazon. Um, just came out today, and, and it's great. It. Um, I was reading through the beginning part of it. it. Has a lot of myths on there. Like, is this true? Is this false? And why? The, um, yeah, which I thought it, was super helpful. It's you know, it's plain again, plain language written to be a. It's it's designed to be a hand holding guide for you, for moms, for, frankly, and for parents, and to, to try um, to cut through a lot of the mythology. So Jill was writing on here that she is attending her first IEP meeting on Wednesday, um, as a parent. Right. She's always is as a parent. An IEP meeting is very, but not in a bad way. It's just different. I can't read the rest of it. But Jill, good luck to you. It's a very. Uh, 
I think it's a very different experience. Um, I think my sister's a teacher, and um, you know, I have loved all of the teachers that my daughter has had, have been so lovely. And you know, hopefully, you will get the same thing on Wednesday and um, share your story. I um, think if you find, moms. I do find you get the proverbial more fly with honey kind of mm -hmm. thing more more you know like you yeah. know to go in honey, positively more you know go positive. go in positively until you have to punch someone in the face you know. i mean just stay positive <laughs> until know, they're not to, listening to, and then you have to lose uh, you know, your mind on the internet other yeah. than that though try positive to, honey try to be positive lots of first honey and see what you're okay so um so let's say so just to clarify so we're saying it's important to find a psychologist and i said to you like how do you find the right one is it because to me, I call you like an educational psychologist, but you said you don't like that well, title. Well, it, it, it locks you in. in I don't a want to lock way. you in. I don't want, I don't want, I, to, I don't box want to box, box in. Okay, so but, what would what would people be well, searching for? I think, first of all, moms, I also think word of mouth is very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you ask your friends, you ask, I, you ask your friends who might you go to, you know, my kids struggling in school, do you know mm -hmm. of any? I think word of mouth is very, very helpful. Secondarily, I would go to your pediatrician. Yeah. Pediatricians tend to know the the practitioners in the community that have a decent reputation. That I, I find very helpful. Um, just starting with that, you know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's good. You know, that's perfect. Um, well, listen, thank you guys so much thanks. for watching, uh, and thanks Selzy for being here again. He's gonna try to get on every show, but he's not invited to every show. Um, next week, we our next month we have Dr. Galloway. Uh, who he is a good guy who we also worked with uh, with vision therapy but he'll be talking about um, vision issues and how they affect learning and things that you should be looking for uh, which I think is another you know vision it isn't checked until like you go to the doctor's office once a year and they're like can you read that chart and then that's it that's all you get so um, I think we're gonna learn a lot next week um, next month I used to see it. Tipsy Tuesdays every week, and I drink a lot, so I forget that this is monthly. Um, but we do drink in your water. Um, but we do have uh, some great programming coming up um, uh, for Autism Awareness Month as well. Um, so we have some great things. If you have any ideas, you can always uh, email us at advocate at onefunnymother.com. If you have certain questions that you'd like us to talk about or any ideas for future shows, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Megan, producer Megan, was great. You guys haven't met Megan, and I don't think tonight's the night. <laughs> She's got a little hair thing going on. So uh, <laughs> she actually looks really cute because she's in college and college kids are cute. Um, so uh, so that's it. So thank you. Thank you. Did thank you have a good time? Much. I had a great time. And I you'll love, come back another time it. with I a hope, different I scarf. It was helpful to you. It'll to be you guys great. Right? Thank you. Great thank stuff. You very much. All right. Well, thanks guys thank so much for watching. Thanks this whole so show uh, will be on Facebook. It'll also be living on YouTube. Uh, and we're looking to turn these into a podcast. So hopefully a lot more people will be able to hear what we're talking about. But um, do us a favor and share this broadcast if you have a moment uh, with somebody that you know that might want to listen to it and, uh, and let us know how we're doing. So thanks so much, everybody, and we'll see you next time. See ya.